Okay, so now that we've looked at the anatomy of the foot, let's go ahead and check out how shoes impact our feet and the biomechanics of the foot. A lot of the information I'm going to be sharing in this lecture comes from a book called The Barefoot Book, 50 Great Reasons to Kick Off Your Shoes. It's a wonderful book. I highly recommend it. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at the LU Bookstore, other bookstores. Uh, check it out at your library. It's a great book. Um, highly, highly, highly recommend. Anyway, the central question that I have for you now and the central question posed in the Barefoot book is, can shoes affect your feet? And when you look at a picture like this, for example, with a foot inside of a clear shoe, I think it's clear that shoes can affect your feet. They affect the anatomy of the foot, the shape of the foot. Clearly, the foot inside this shoe looks different than the foot outside the shoe. The toes are scrunched together, especially that big toe, the halix, is pushed in toward uh, medially, or I should say laterally, uh, toward the other uh, toes. Shoes can affect both the anatomy and the biomechanics of the foot. And the problem is not so much, I guess I don't have a problem with shoes per se. The real problem is, it's actually twofold. We have two problems. One is the design of our shoes. The shoes that we wear in the United States and in other kind of Western cultures the shoes that we wear are very poorly designed. That is because they're designed for fashion, not for function. They're not designed around the anatomy of the foot. They're not designed around the biomechanics of the foot. They're designed for fashion. And our sense of fashion is warped, quite frankly. It's a bit distorted. We like, for example, small feet. I do not know why, but our culture likes small feet, and so we design shoes, especially with this these kind of pointed toe, these shoes to make to give the illusion that our feet are a little bit smaller or to even scrunch our feet up to make them smaller. So that's one problem is our shoes are very poorly designed. And that's just one design flaw that I just mentioned as far as the what's called the toe box. The second problem is that we wear shoes way too often. So a shoe is a tool and there is a time when wearing shoes is prudent when it might be safer to wear a shoe than to go barefoot. But quite frankly, living in a place like the United States, living in a place like Virginia, anywhere in the United States, anywhere in a developed nation, uh, we do not need to wear shoes very often. I go barefoot all the time. I am living proof that you can go pretty much anywhere barefoot safely. I've been doing it this for, you know, close, I guess about 15 years now where I've been mostly barefoot. And our feet are per perfectly capable of getting around on different surfaces, on grass, obviously, dirt, rocks, sidewalks, concrete, pavement. Our feet don't really care. They're designed to handle these sorts of different environments. And shoes are actually uh, not all that people think they are in terms of um, the benefits. So uh, our, our feet are designed to be bare, to be quite frankly. To be quite frank with you, our feet were designed to be bare. The shoe is a man-made add-on that the foot was not designed for. Now again, I'm not saying that it's not prudent to wear shoes in specific environments, but I'm saying it's unnatural to wear shoes, and our feet are not really designed for wearing shoes. Just, you know, it's prudent to wear gloves sometimes. It's prudent to wear helmets sometimes, but that doesn't mean that our heads were designed for helmets or that our hands were designed for gloves. And in fact, if you wear helmets or gloves for long periods of time, it will certainly have an impact on your hands and your head to uh, more or less degrees. Our feet in particular have, a, you know, it are greatly impacted by the constant use of shoes. We're wearing shoes every day, literally every day. Can you tell me the last time you went a day without putting on shoes. You woke up in the morning barefoot. You went around all day barefoot. You went to bed that night barefoot and you never put on a shoe. It's very rare uh, for us to do that, for most people to do that. And so if you're putting on shoes every day, if you're wearing them most of the, most of the time throughout the day, you're wearing them all day, every day, seven days a week, our feet never really get any exercise. They don't get to breathe. They don't get to do what they were designed to do or what they're built to do. 
and they suffer consequences for it. So that's my real problem with shoes is that they're poorly designed and we wear them way too often. You ought to be giving your feet some barefoot time and by barefoot time, I'm not talking about just kicking them off while you're sitting down. It's easy to do that. A lot of us actually do uh, kick off our shoes if we're sitting down at a table, if we're sitting at a desk. If we're uh, What I'm talking about is walking walking. You need to walk barefoot. That's the best thing you can do for your feet is walk barefoot. It lets your feet work biomechanically to go through the motions of walking, to have all of these muscles and joints and ligaments activated and doing what they're supposed to be doing, getting proper biofeedback from the sole of your foot uh, to tell your brain about the different textures and uh, you know of the ground and all the, all the changes that your body is going to respond to in terms of uh, changing your gait all of this is wonderful stuff for your reflexes, for your body, all the way up from your feet. So walk around barefoot sometime and give your feet some exercise. But the short answer is, yes, shoes can affect our feet. Can shoes affect the way we walk and the way we run? Well, the answer to that is yes, too. Let's take a look at this. So obviously here, uh, this woman is putting on a really bizarre, uh, dramatically uh, gait-altering uh, shoe. But as she puts on the shoe, you, you can immediately tell that it affects the way she stands and it affects the way she walks. It affects the gait cycle. It affects which muscles are being activated when and how. It affects the joints and the angles of the joints and the range of motion on the joints. It affects the bones and the way the weight of your body is being transferred down your legs and through your feet. It affects the movement and the biomechanics of the foot, the arches, uh, all of these sorts of things. So, yes, the answer is yes. Uh, shoes can affect the way we walk. Now, obviously, this is super extreme to illustrate the point. But, in fact, all shoes change the way we walk to some more or less degree. And these changes, it turns out, are pretty much negative uh, to, the, to our joints, to the muscles, to the bones of our body. Yeah, shoes can affect not only the way we stand, but the way we walk and the way we run. Well, I have a question for you <clears throat> regarding barefoot, going barefoot and driving barefoot. You guys are scattered all over the country. Uh, you come from a variety of different states. So tell me, in your state, is it legal to drive barefoot or is it illegal to drive barefoot? Now, these sorts of laws vary from one state to another, so it's possible <clears throat> that it may be legal to drive in one state and Ill illegal to drive in another state. But do you know if it's legal or illegal to drive barefoot in the state where you live? If you're pulled over by a cop and, you know, for maybe speeding or something else, and the cop uh, looks inside the car and sees that you're barefoot, <clears throat> can you be ticketed for that? When I ask my class, I used to ask my class this question every semester. I did it for a few years and the results were pretty consistent. And here are what the results are. About two-thirds of the class says that yes, it is illegal to drive barefoot in their state. And about one-third of the class says that it's legal to drive barefoot in their state. Okay, so again, these laws vary from one place to another, so it could be possible that for you know two-thirds of the states it's illegal and one-third of the states it's legal. But I know something um, that perhaps many people don't know. It is actually legal to drive barefoot in all 50 states of the United States of America and in the District of Columbia and in all territories of the United States. It is perfectly legal to drive barefoot. In other words, two-thirds of you were wrong. Two-thirds of American young drivers believe a law that simply is not on the books. Why is it that we believe? Why is it that two-thirds of people believe that there's a law when there is no law? Why is it that so many people think that this particular act is illegal when in fact it's legal? And the answer to that question gets to where we get our facts from. From where do we get our facts? So it turns out there are only two sources for getting facts. One is personal experience, and the other is the word of others. 
that's it. If you can think of a third way, please uh, send me an email and let me know. But there are only two ways, as far as I can see and most others can see. There are only two ways to get facts, personal experience or the word of others. The word of others who ideally have had their own personal experience. Now, it turns out that most of what we know is based on, number two, the word of others, especially when it comes to academic facts, things like, you know, what is a law, what is not a law. So personal experience, you know, can tell you that um, a stove is hot or you can uh, be told a stove is hot. Now, a lot of us, you know, when it comes to things like that, uh, have a hard time believing what other people tell us. And so we have to learn from personal experience through the school of hard knocks. But it turns out that a lot of what we know actually is not from personal experience. I, getting by in the world, a lot of what we know in terms of getting by in the world, the street, street knowledge, you might say, is personal experience. The more academic we get, the more we, we rely on the word of others, that is authority figures. I'll give you an example, an, a quick example. Do you know how far away the sun is from the earth? Now, maybe you don't. Uh, I suspect that many of you do have an idea, but it turns out that it's about 93 million miles. Okay. Uh, if you knew that, uh, how did you know that? Did you measure it? No, you were told that it was 93 million miles from someone else who measured it. Of course, it varies a little bit because the, the orbit is a, not a circle, but it's a, approximately 93 million miles. Let me ask you this. Who uh, wrote the Declaration of Independence? That's right. George Washington wrote the Declaration. Whoa, wait a minute. Not George Washington. Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence. How do you know that? Did you see Thomas Jefferson write the Declaration of Independence? Of course you didn't. So the only way we know these things is because we've been told this by other people that we trust. And eventually, we trace this back, this knowledge, back to someone who did witness Thomas Jefferson writing the Declaration of Independence. But you get the point. We either, can, we either know something, we either get our facts from personal experience or the word of others. C.S. Lewis, who is pictured here, is one of my favorite people in the world. And C.S. Lewis said this one time. Authority not only uh, combines with experience to produce the raw material of the facts, but also has to be frequently used instead of reasoning itself as a method of getting conclusions. For example, a few of us have followed the reasoning on which even 10% of the truths that we believe are based. We accept them on authority from the experts and are wise to do so, for though we are thereby sometimes deceived, yet we should have to live as savages if we did not. In other words... 90% of what we know is from number two, the word of authority, uh, the word of others, not from number one, personal experience. And if we rejected all of this uh, word from others because we didn't trust it, we would have to give up 90% of what we know and resort to living like an animal or a savage again. So we absolutely need this uh, word of others as a way of getting facts. But the problem, and C.S. Lewis recognized it, was that we can thereby be sometimes deceived, which sometimes deceived might make a title for another great book. Uh, you should check that out. We can be sometimes deceived if the authorities are wrong. Now, in my opinion, there are two places where authorities are wrong that I'm kind of passionate about. Number one is on origins, human origins, creation and evolution. The authorities in our culture tell us that we evolved, that we share a common ancestor with the apes. I, I reject that. I reject it not on purely religious grounds. I reject it also on scientific grounds. And I've, that's, I wrote a whole book on that. It's called Sometimes Deceived. And we cover a lot of that in another course called Biology 316, which I would invite you to take. But I believe the authority figures are wrong and we're being deceived because they're wrong. Another place is footwear. The authority figures are telling us that these are modern necessities, that there are certain features that we should be looking for and demanding in a good pair, quote unquote, a good pair of shoes. And quite frankly, they're wrong. They're telling us that going barefoot is dangerous, that it's unsafe, that it can cause all sorts of problems, that it can make you go blind and your hair will fall out. 
Well, quite frankly, they're wrong. So there are places where the authority figures are wrong, but most of the time they're right. And by the way, I guess you as a student should be listening to what I say and considering that I might be wrong. Maybe I am wrong. Obviously, I'm convinced that I'm right. And I think I've got data and evidence and personal experience to validate my beliefs about going barefoot versus wearing shoes. But I could be wrong. That's up to you to decide, I suppose. But let your decision be based on facts and not, um, you know, wives' tales or uh, just cultural uh, norms. Here are some things that are undisputably caused by wearing shoes. Athlete's foot. There's no dispute that athlete's foot is caused by wearing shoes. There is a uh, deception about this from um, one particular, actually, I'm sure it's multiple um, sources that do this, but there is a commercial on television for a, a um, antifungal cream called Lamisil, which is used to treat athlete's foot. There are uh, Lamisil, as a company, has produced, obviously, multiple uh, commercials, and I've watched a number of them, probably half a dozen or so of their commercials, and all of them are either implicitly lying or explicitly lying to the consumer. This is extremely frustrating because, you know, when you see this happen in a place where you know it's happening, you, al you also have to wonder how many times it happens when you're unaware of it and you don't know it. But Lamisil lies in their commercials, and they imply or explicitly state that going barefoot will give you athlete's foot. This is absolutely not true. Wearing shoes will give you athlete's foot. And although the American Podiatric uh, Association will not come out and say that, uh, the, Ameri uh, the dermat American Dermatological uh, Dermatology uh, Society has come out and said that. So dermatologists recognize that athlete's foot is caused by wearing shoes and that in fact the best way to avoid athlete's foot is to not wear shoes and the best way to cure athlete's foot if you have it is to stop wearing shoes. So this is a treatment for athlete's foot is to stop wearing closed toe shoes. Toenail fungus, same thing. It's caused by the same fungus. Pseudomonas infunction, uh, infections, Halix valgus, bunions, ingrown toenails, hammer toes, Morton's neuroma, fallen arches, plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciosis. We'll get into that later. All of these things are indisputably caused by footwear. And you can alleviate the symptoms or prevent these problems simply by going barefoot and ditching your shoes. Also, outside the foot, knee osteoarthritis is known to be caused by footwear and hip and back pain is known to be caused by footwear. You know, twice in the Old Testament, uh, God said something very interesting when it comes to shoes. And Exodus 3.5 is one instance where he said this to Moses. He also said it to uh, Joshua in another instance. But he said, take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. I love this, obviously, as a barefooter. I, I love this. But it's also interesting that, you know, why is this in the scripture? Why would God tell Moses at the burning bush to take off his sandals for the place you are standing is holy ground. Um, I don't know. I, it, I don't know what it is about shoes or footwear that would be defiling in such an environment. But I, I suspect, and I'm certainly hopeful, that footwear will not be a requirement in heaven. And that when we walk in those streets of gold, we will do so barefoot. You know, sandals were a thing. Jesus wore sandals. And um, as again, as I said before... Shoes, i.e. sandals usually, are, are sufficient. Uh, shoes are, may be prudent to protect your feet from certain um, environmental hazards. I'll give you, an, I'll give you the, another example that's opposite of this. Uh, so here in Exodus, uh, God was telling Moses to take off his sandals. But there's, uh, if you recall the Passover event where they were to eat the lamb, uh, the night of the Passover, they were to eat the lamb with their sandals on, and with their, you know, their their um, clothes in a, in a way that they're ready to, to leave the house quickly. So he specifically said, "Eat this, eat this lamb with your um, your coat on, your 
your your clothes uh, zipped up and ready to go and your shoes on as if you're getting ready to flee as if you're getting ready to run out of your house and take off uh, so obviously you know I'm not reading too much into this and say oh God hates shoes and God wants you to always be barefoot no shoes are tools and there's times for them but I find that verse particularly interesting about not wearing shoes on holy ground by the way uh, in Central Virginia, I can't think of more holier ground than Liberty University. We ought to be banning shoes here because it's holy ground. What about safety? You know, when, when I ask people, why are you wearing shoes? And I, this is something else I've done. I've asked, uh, I used to ask students in class at the start of this lecture, I would usually ask, why are you wearing shoes right now? Because most of the people in the class would be wearing shoes. And uh, the number one answer is, I don't know. I mean, literally, that's the number one answer. I don't know. That's just what we're supposed to do. Um, okay, fine. When pressed to go beyond that, the number two answer is protection. Okay, protection from what? And usually it falls into two categories. Protection from germs and protection from dangerous things. All right, so shoes uh, and safety. Shoes can protect us, I guess, um, from dangerous things, but usually not the type of shoes we're wearing. Uh, so, you know, whatever. And obviously, as we're looking at here in this x-ray of a person who stepped on a nail, which has penetrated their foot, I'd say at least a half an inch, if not a whole inch, it goes almost all the way to the sesamoid bones under the first MTP joint. They stepped on a nail with a shoe on. The nail penetrated the shoe, penetrated the foot. Now, you could argue that the shoe, uh, that the nail did not penetrate the foot as far as it would have because of the shoe. And while the shoe didn't stop the nail from penetrating the foot, perhaps it prevented it from going deeper. Um, maybe. I don't know of any empirical evidence for that. I do know that um, I do have some anecdotal ideas and I have some logic and reason based um, ideas that are not so much based on empirical data or observations, but are based more on logic and the way the human body works. And here, here is what I would argue as a counter to this. First of all, reflexes. Our reflexes are very, very fast. And as soon as uh, you feel a nail going into your foot, you're going to initiate reflexes, which are done in millisecond time scales, like five milliseconds, it's over. Uh, reflexes that are going to get your foot off that nail. In a shoe, these reflexes are going to be slowed down. Why do I say that? Because when you're walking in shoes, I, again, I don't have empirical data for this. I haven't made measurements, but I'm telling you, I know from my own personal experience and just seeing other people. So that's observation. I know that this is true, that we walk uh, different in shoes. And one way we walk different is clumsier, lazier, and more forceful. So what I mean by lazier is that we're not paying attention quite as much. One of the things that you learn to do when you're walking barefoot is keep your eye on where you're stepping. And it becomes second nature, so it's not something that's really distracting, but you pay attention to where you're walking when you're barefoot, especially if you are, you know, a, a person who barefoots frequently. Then you learn to keep an eye on where you're walking. You know, there's this, there's this saying or this story about a farmer and a city slicker. And the city slicker came out to the farm to visit the farmer, and the farmer was taking him out into the fields and within, you know, five steps, the farmer had, the, uh, the city slicker had stepped on a cow pie and gotten uh, all over his shoes. And the farmer can walk around all day and not do this. Why? Because the farmer has learned to watch where he's stepping to avoid this in a way that the city slicker hasn't. Okay, so when you're walking around with shoes on, you don't need to pay attention, quite frankly, I guess. You don't need to pay attention as well, and so you don't. And so you're slamming your foot down, you're slamming your foot down, you're just slamming your, and you slam your foot down on a nail. Well, I think if you're barefoot, A, you're less likely to step on the nail in the first place because you're paying more attention to where you're, you're walking, and two, you don't walk so heavy. You're not slamming, slamming, slamming uh, like you do in shoes. So I don't think that wearing a shoe is particularly that much better in terms of getting a nail in your foot. Also, uh, a podiatrist that I uh, know and love by the name of Dr. Blaze told me that he has had lots of patients who have uh, come to him with nails embedded in their feet uh, from 
you know, while they were wearing shoes. And of course, the emergency room gets a lot of this as well. But um, he tells me that very frequently, the majority of the time, uh, when you're stepping on a barefoot, uh, when you're stepping on a nail with a shoe on, that a piece of the rubber from the sole of the shoe and a piece of like perhaps cotton from the sock that the person is wearing gets embedded in the puncture wound, the puncture wound. So now you have another problem. You have a foreign object that's embedded an inch into your body and it has to come out. So this essentially is going to require some surgery to remove this foreign object, uh, the, the sock or a piece of the sock or a piece of the shoe sole, which obviously doesn't happen when you're barefoot. A study has been done comparing uh, infections from stepping on nails in shoes versus not in shoes. And in that study, uh, they were looking at pseudomonas inf infections because pseudomonas is a very serious infection. If you get pseudomonas in your blood, it can be fatal, in fact. And in the study, that particular study, uh, about 50% of the people that stepped on a nail with a shoe on had a pseudomonas infection in the wound. Whereas zero of those who stepped on a nail barefoot had a pseudomonas infection. Why? Because pseudomonas does not live on the skin of your body and pseudomonas does not live on the nail, but pseudomonas lives in your shoe. One of the reasons why your shoes stink, and by the way, feet don't stink, shoes stink. Feet only stink when they've been in shoes. Just as if you wore gloves for 15 hours a day, your gloves would stink and your hands would stink uh, as a result. Pseudomonas lives in your shoes, and that's partly why your shoes smell so bad. And the pseudomonas, when it gets into your foot from a puncture wound, uh, can cause a pretty serious infection. I have a friend in Chicago. His name is Pete. He's a carpenter, and he's a full-time barefooter in Chicago. I don't even know how you pull that off uh, in the winter in Chicago, but he does it. Anyway, Pete has told me that he has stepped on nails as a carpenter, uh, both barefoot and with shoes on, and he assures me it hurts both ways. All right, shoes protecting us from germs. Is this true? Do shoes protect us from germs? Well, yes and no. Uh, I just told you that Pseudomonas lives in your shoe, but also uh, Tinea pedis lives in your shoe, which is a fungus. Now, these organisms do not live on your skin normally. Uh, we do have bacteria and different types of microbes that live on our skin all over our body, but most of them are not pathogens. And the these two organisms, Pseudomonas and Tinea pedis, are pathogens, and they can cause some pretty severe infections. And they do not live on our skin naturally, but they live on in your shoes, cause your shoes to stink, and then cause problems with your feet. When it comes to athlete's foot and toenail fungus, which are both caused by tinea pedis, we find that men suffer from athlete's foot uh, seven times more than women. Now, why do you suppose that is? The answer is that men are more often wearing closed toe shoes and socks than women. Women, in terms of professional dress, it's acceptable for women to, to wear sandals and open toe shoes and shoes that basically allow your feet to breathe. So men are more likely or more often stuffing their feet into a shoe, a closed shoe and a sock where it's a dark, warm, moist, sweaty environment, which is perfect for the growth of these bacteria and fungi and leads to infections. Women are more likely or are, are, it's more or more often wearing shoes that allow their feet to get air and sunshine and just to breathe. And these organisms do not thrive very well in those conditions. The UV radiation of sunshine uh, is a natural killer of microorganisms and the you know desiccating effects of the air and wind and that sort of things, keeping your skin dry so it's not constantly wet and moist uh, from sweat. Uh, allowing your skin to just be dry and to get some UV radiation does wonders for the skin on your feet and keeping them healthy. So uh, it's another good reason uh, to just go barefoot or at least wear flip-flops or sandals or uh, shoes that allow your feet to breathe a little bit more. Athlete's foot does not occur among people who traditionally go barefoot. That is a quote from the American Academy of Dermatology. They understand that athlete's foot and toenail fungus are caused from closed toe shoes. 
A bunion is a bump that occurs on the medial aspect of the foot uh, just proximal to the big toe or the hallux. It is often accompanied with a bending of the hallux laterally or pointing outward of the big toe as is shown here, which is called hallux valgus. So bunions and hallux valgus are considered by many people to be genetic because, especially with women, uh, this is seen on both men and women, but a little bit more commonly on women for reasons that I will explain in just a second. But a lot of women look at their, you know, girls will look at their moms and they'll look at their grandmothers and they'll say, oh, my grandmother has a bunion. My mother has a bunion. I guess I'll have a bunion too. And that it's genetic. Well, that's a half truth. There is, I would say instead, a genetic propensity for a bunion and or hallux valgus. And both of those things usually go together Halix valgus and bunions. There's a genetic propensity for it. So that means you might be susceptible to get bunions, but only if the conditions are right. What are the conditions? Shoes. When you look at cultures today where the people habitually go barefoot, and there are still cultures where people habitually go barefoot, you do not see halix valgus or bunions in those people. When you look in the past, at um, paintings and statues from people from particularly the Roman era. There's lots of statues from the Roman Roman era. And uh, these statues, these paintings, often show feet. And these statues and paintings are usually very anatomically correct, but they never show bunions or halix valgus. Now, you could argue, I suppose, that they just don't want to show them because they might find them unseemly or something, but to have so many different artists uh, never depict these structures, even though they would appear on people, I think is unlikely. I think it's more likely that they didn't encounter halix valgus and bunions because they didn't wear the closed toe shoes that we wear today. Romans were most famous for wearing their Roman sandals. And uh, people back in those times either did go barefoot or wore open toe sandals uh, very infrequently would wear closed toe shoes. So uh, I think it's, uh, you know, we see halix valgus and bunions follow a genetic pattern often, but only in societies where shoe wearing is common, especially shoes where you have very pointed toes like we're showing here. Uh, you have a shoe in, in panel B, which is obviously a pointed toe shoe, a high heel shoe, and the foot essentially is taken on the shape of the shoe, which is what happens over time uh, when you wear these shoes for decades and decades. So here's the, these are two x-rays of the same pair of feet in a shoe and out of a shoe. And you'll see that in the shoe, the pointed toe shoe, that the toes are all scrunched together. You take the shoes off and you stand and the toes spread back out again. Now that's lovely. That's wonderful uh, that that happens. It turns out that it only happens while you're young. The older you get, the longer you wear those sorts of shoes, the less plastic, we say, the foot becomes, the less malleable, and the more it takes on permanently the shape of that shoe. Now again, this does happen in men as well as women. And when, when men wear pointed toe shoes, in particular things like cowboy boots and those sorts of things, if, if that's what they uh, habitually wear, then bunions and halix valgus will show up in men just as it does in women. This is an irreversible damage that's caused by shoes, and the only way to correct this essentially is by surgery. Hammer toe and ingrown toenails are two other problems that are caused by shoes, particularly shoes with narrow toe boxes, shallow toe boxes, uh, and shoes that are just too small. Now we commonly wear shoes that are too small because we like small feet in our culture for reasons I don't fully understand, but we do. And our shoes have these very narrow uh, toe boxes or we wear them too small and or we wear them too small in order to make our feet look a little bit smaller. The consequence of that is that the toenail is continued, the pressure that's constantly on the toenail eventually drives it uh, into abnormal contours and shapes which result in ingrown toenails. The toes will get permanently bent uh, because of the toe box being too short, a condition called hammer toe. And no one disputes that these are caused by shoes, okay? This is not just some kind of Howell conspiracy theory. Uh, everybody recognizes that these are caused by shoes. 
And in fact, even podiatrists who are loath to blame anything on the shoe, uh, even they understand and proclaim that shoes that are too small or have uh, toe boxes that are too small can result in hammer toe. And even they are willing to admit that uh, going barefoot or wearing open toe sandals is a remedy for this, at least for young people. Children often develop hammer toe. They're susceptible to this because they are often wearing shoes that are too small. Uh, children's feet are always growing and getting bigger. Shoes are expensive. Parents are reluctant to constantly buy new shoes at a rate to keep up with their growing feet. And so it's not too uncommon for children to get hammer toe. And when that happens, uh, the doctor, the family doctor or podiatrist may advise that the child go barefoot more often or wear flip-flops or open toe sorts of shoes and the toe can straighten out over time. In adults, uh, hammer toe is permanent and seems to be irreversible. Plantar fasciitis is probably something you've heard of. A lot of people suffer from plantar fasciitis. Now remind me, what does ITIS stand for? That's right, inflammation. What does IOSIS stand for? That stands for necrotic tissue or dead tissue. So plantar fasciitis is inflamed tissue and plantar fasciosis would be dead or necrotic tissue. Um, mo there's an interesting study that came out. The <clears throat> gentleman that's being shown here in this uh, thumbnail is a guy by the name of Ray McClanahan. He's a podiatrist out in Portland, Oregon, and he wrote the foreword to the Barefoot book. And he uh, was part of a research team that was studying plantar fasciitis and discovered something unusual. Now, if you have plantar fasciitis really badly and chronic plantar fasciitis that you just can't seem to get rid of, one last ditch effort to treat the pain of plantar fasciitis is to cut the plantar fascia, to surgically go into your foot and simply slice the plantar fascia and just cut it. Now that obviously has an effect on the biomechanics of the foot and on the arches, but it does relieve the pain, which can be severe for people that have chronic plantar fasciitis. So it, like I said, it's kind of a last, a last ditch effort. Now in this study, 50 patients who were going into to surgery to have their plantar fascia severed, 50 patients were uh, and went into surgery and while they were inside the foot cutting the plantar fascia, they took a biopsy. So they took a small sample of the plantar fascia and looked at it under a microscope. And what they found was that zero of these patients had plantar fasciitis, zero out of 50. But 50 out of 50 had plantar fasciosis. So the question now becomes, what in the world would be causing uh, dead tissue to develop in the plantar fascia? And their hypothesis goes back to uh, what I mentioned previously about the blood supply to the foot. Remember the anterior tibial artery supplies the dorsum of the foot and the posterior tibial artery supplies the sole of the foot where you find the plantar fascia. Well, the posterior tibial artery passes through the tarsal tunnel and then under a muscle called the abductor hallucis muscle. And you can see here that the muscle has been kind of reflected back to show you the passageway of the posterior tibial artery. Well, what the um, authors of this study uh, hypothesized or kind of concluded as to what may be the cause of plantar fascia was shoes. Shoes are the cause. And the reason the features that you find in shoes that are causing the problem would be the elevated toe spring. So the, to the toes of the foot are kept in an up off the ground and the elevated heel. Now virtually every shoe on the planet has an elevated heel. Even a lot of sandals have a, a heel of a half an inch or more in them. I do not know what our obsession is with the elevated heel. I, don't, I mean, I don't know why we're so obsessed with elevated heels. I mean, obviously they add an inch or so to your height. Okay, that's fine. Um, okay, whatever. The toe spring, the reason why you have an elevated toe is because the sole of the shoe is very hard and it's really difficult to walk on that shoe with such a hard sole. The sole is made hard so that it's more durable and lasts longer, but it's extremely difficult to walk. So the toe is curved upward to convert your step into a rolling motion. So you roll into your step. 
and that makes walking a lot easier with these hard soled shoes. So this is called the toe spring where the toes are lifted up and of course this shoe also has inside of it an arch support and the toe box <clears throat> is you know kind of that uh, curvature shape to it. It's not shaped like the your toes are shaped. <clears throat> it is narrow. So we have a narrow toe box, a raised toe, bro toe box, what's called a toe spring, a raised heel, and an arch support. And the lowest part of your foot here is the ball of your foot. All of these features are conspiring together to put your foot into a rather awkward position where your heel is up, your toes are up, the ball of your foot is the lowest place it can be, <clears throat> and your arch is locked. And what this is doing is it's locking your foot into a, an engaged windlass position. Now, I'm going to talk about the windlass mechanism in a few minutes. It's a very, um, I'm very excited about that. I, it's one of my favorite things in the foot. It's not complicated. It's pretty simple, but I just think it's really cool. But the point is the, the foot is being locked into a position in which the flow of blood through the posterior tibial artery is being impeded. <clears throat> now, you see that the posterior tibial artery is going under the abductor hallucis muscle. When you're standing barefoot, when you're walking barefoot, you are constantly, as we mentioned previously with the arches, they're, they're rising, they're collapsing, they're rising, they're collapsing, your body weight is moving forward and through the foot and all sorts of things. And basically, you're pulling on the, on the arch, you're relaxing the arch. You're pulling on the arch, you're relaxing the arch. You're pulling on the arch, you're relaxing the arch. And so there's constant movement. And this is good as far as, you know, this is fine as far as blood flow through the foot is concerned. But when you put the foot, when you lock it in a cast called a shoe, with the heel up, the toes up, the and an arch support, and the toes scrunched together, <clears throat> it puts tension on the abductor hallucis. It puts tension on the entire arch system, including the abductor hall hallucis muscle. And that tension uh, puts pressure on the posterior tibial artery and impedes the flow of blood through the artery and into the sole of the foot. Now, it doesn't stop the flow of blood. It just slows, it just pinches that vessel a little bit and reduces the flow of blood to the point that the plantar fascia really cannot be sustained um, by the, the reduced blood flow and the lack of oxygen and the lack of nutrients results in cells dying and then you get necrosis or necrotic cells or dead cells. And so they are su uh, suggesting that shoes with these features are the main culprit behind plantar fasciitis, which is not actually plantar fasciitis, it's plantar fasciosis. So probably most, if not all, diagnoses of plantar fasciitis may actually be plantar fasciosis. And the reason lies in the shoe. I'd like for you to watch that video. We're not going to, I'm not going to put it on here, but I'd like for you to watch that video on YouTube. He unpacks that a little bit more. So here is a poster of some of my own research uh, that I did a few years ago with uh, a graduate student named Megan Boyer. And in this study, I was looking at arches and the effect of, well, there were two things. First, I was just describing the methodology of the transverse arch index. So remember, I uh, kind of created a new, uh, my own method of measuring arches uh, from a footprint called the transverse arch index. And so I described that in this poster and then also used uh, this methodology to follow the arches, or uh, yeah, to follow the arches of a man who had decided to ditch his shoes and adopt, some, you know, basically a barefoot lifestyle as much as possible, you know, in our modern world. Of course, um, I am very blessed to be able to work barefoot because my boss has given me permission to do so, but I recognize that not everyone um, has that wonderful opportunity. But, uh, and this, this man doesn't get to uh, go barefoot at work, although he does wear what we would call minimalist shoes. And minimalist shoes are shoes that have a minimal impact on the anatomy and biomechanics of the foot. So um, lots of shoes these days are being marketed as minimalist shoes that, you know, actually aren't. So you've got to be careful about that. But he, um, he wears minimalist shoes when he wears shoes, and then he spends a lot of time out of his shoes and so I wanted to see uh, if there was any impact on his arches and it turns out that yes indeed there is lots of people in in our population in America have flat feet or fallen arches about 25 percent of the population is affected by this now again as I mentioned previously uh, there's a spectrum of arch heights for everyone and so some people are just going to have lower arches than others but there seems to be a disproportionately number of people with low arches that many people blame on 
footwear and particularly arch supports that weaken the arches and cause them to collapse or fall and just become less functional because of these artificial arch supports which uh, inhibit their movements and cause them to get weaker. So I wanted to know if walking barefoot would reverse some of the damage done to the arches and allow low arches to rise back up again. And based on this, which is just an n equals one, okay, I'm looking at one person and following him over time, but this was one person who had uh, pretty low arches. You can see there, I, I basically in my different arches here, I have the red in the, the very low arches in red, moving through yellow up to green to get to the high arches. So yellow would be normal, green would be high, red would be low. And he had, you know, he was definitely red. He got into the orange zone after walking around barefoot and then even up into the yellow zone with a transverse arch index of less than one, 0 0.92. So anything less than one is moving into the high area. Anything lower than one, uh, uh, anything higher than one is a, a low arch. So he went from a TAI of 1.73 all the way down to 0 0.92. Now it took a long time for this to happen. This was over 53 months. Okay, so that's a, a number of years. And, uh, but his arches dramatically did change. So it does seem to be that, it does appear that walking uh, barefoot can raise your arches if you are consistent with it and are willing to do a long time. Now this guy was about 50 years old or, or in his 40s when the study was done. Okay, if you spent four decades walking around in shoes, it might take four years uh, to undo some of that damage. So it's not too un unexpected or surprising that it would take a number of years to reverse some of this when you consider you've been spending decades ruining your feet, uh, wrecking your feet with shoes. So that's that was one study that I did. Um, there's a couple of other similar types of studies that were done uh, from scientists in West Virginia, um, Oregon, um, and up in Harvard. Uh, so I know a few other people that have done, and in West Virginia, I know a few other people that have done these sorts of studies and they've seen similar results. All right, there's a bunch of slides here on uh, the gait cycle. And as I said, I'm gonna kind of pass over this stuff on the gait cycle right now. We won't cover that here in Biology 313, but I do go over it in Biology 316. So if you're interested um, in learning more about the gait cycle, uh, let's go to Biology 316 for that. Okay, the windless mechanism as I've said a few times is one of my favorite things. Not a complicated thing, but it's just a fun thing. So the windlass mechanism is a mechanism for converting the foot into a rigid rod. So when you consider what your foot has to do as you're walking, and again, I'm talking about walking barefoot. So you're walking over, you know, some, you're just walking outside and you're going from a sidewalk, maybe stepping out into the grass, maybe you're hiking. Let's go right out and truly out into nature. And you're on a hiking trail, there's lots of dirt, there's roots, there's small rocks, uh, there's all sorts of uneven terrain that you would experience if you're hiking barefoot, which by the way, you have to do this if you've never done it before. Hiking barefoot is one of the best things ever, okay? So just go to a place where the trails are pretty simple, and by that I mean kind of manicured and, and soft, and the Blackwater Creek trails are really good for that. And uh, it's a good place to start with barefoot hiking. It's really wonderful. But anyway, back to the mechanism. You're, you're walking on different terrain, which is not perfectly even. And so your foot has to be kind of soft and supple and pliable and able to um, twist and rotate and ad adapt and adjust to small roots or small pebbles or rocks or all sorts of uneven things that you might be stepping on. So you need kind of a soft and supple landing foot but as you step off and propel into your next step, all of your body weight is being lifted by your foot. And to achieve that, you need a rigid rod uh, propulsion foot. So we have to convert the foot from something that's kind of flexible and, and, su and supple to rigid uh, and a rigid rod that can lift your body weight. And the windlass mechanism is uh, something that happens in the foot to help this happen. And basically, it involves your arches, and it involves the plantar fascia, and a windlass is a type of a lever system. Well, probably one of the most famous here is a, you know, a water, an old-timey water well. You have a bucket, and a on a on a rope or a chain that's wrapped around a axle, if you will, and then a handle that you rotate so you can 
rotate the handle one way and drop the pail down into the water, fill it up with water, and then rotate the handle the other way and it lifts it up, lifts the pail up with the water so you can retrieve it out of the well. This lever system is called a windlass. It's also seen on boats uh, sometimes for lifting the anchor when you throw the anchor over the water and then you roll it, um, turn the, the crank the crank shaft to um, bring the anchor back up. So that's a windlass. We have something kind of like that in the foot with the plantar fascia. So it involves the plantar fascia. Let's see what's the best way to see it here. <clears throat> the plantar fascia is along the bottom of the foot here from heel to the first MTP joint and these points uh, on the heel, the talus, the calcaneus, the talus, and the head of the <clears throat> first metatarsal, excuse me, you know, are kind of marking a triangle. And uh, with the plantar fascia along the <clears throat> bottom of your foot, obviously. And with the toes ex uh, straight out, there's a certain amount of tension on the plantar fascia. Now that fascia actually extends past, if you look carefully, it extends past the first MTP and goes all the way out to the distal phalanx. So that fascia is extending all the way through the toes. And there's a certain amount of tension on it when your foot is flat, but it's kind of loose. When you uh, lift your foot up like this, that is to say, um, you know, you uh, as you're taking a step up and going into uh, dorsiflexion, the um, plantar fascia Extends, extending from the calcaneus is now winding around the MTP joint as it continues out to the distal phalanx of the big toe. So that cranking around that joint is what is similar to the cranking of a handle on a well. Okay, so that cranking on the joint uh, puts extra tension on the plantar fascia and in fact uh, pulls your whole foot together and lifts the arches as depicted by this arrow here, the medial longitudinal arch will rise up. So your arch rises up and your foot is compressed. The length of your foot is compressed and it actually shortens your foot by about one centimeter, maybe even more, maybe up to about half an inch. So as you step up on your tiptoes, or technically on the ball of your foot, uh, your foot shortens about a half an inch or at least a centimeter. From the distance uh, from the calcaneus, that point on the calcaneus to the point on the head of the metatarsal will shorten about one centimeter, if not more. And that is locking the bones together. So these bones in here, all these bones in your foot are getting compressed and locked together and it converts your foot into a rigid rod, which is able to support your body weight and thrust you forward. When the foot is down in this position, all the joints are a little bit looser, the bones are not locked together and the foot can conform and deform uh, to the ground as necessary. So this conversion of the foot from a supple landing platform to a rigid propulsion rod is mediated by the windlass mechanism and the arches of the foot. Here is a video of this happening with a student of mine and you can see the arch lifting up and you can also see that the foot uh, gets a little bit shorter. Okay, so nothing with that windlass mechanism happens inside of a shoe because the shoe is a rigid cast that immobilizes the foot. It permanently keeps the toes in a hyperextended position uh, because of the toe spring. It locks the arch in position because of the elevated heel and the artificial arch support. And so the immobilized foot doesn't go through these transformations as you walk. Thankfully, I guess, they don't need to go through these transformations because the, sh the whole point, remember, of the windlass mechanism is to convert the foot from a supple landing foot to a rigid propulsion rod. If you're in a 
hard shoe, uh, the shoe, you know, when you land on the shoe, you don't need a um, supple landing foot, and the shoe is rigid and hard enough to support uh, your body weight as you propel off into your next step or roll into your next step off the toe spring using uh, your shoe. So none of this really matters inside of a shoe. So shoes affect the biomechanics of the foot. They alter the function of the windlass mechanism. Shoes uh, change the way we stand as well as the way we walk and also the way we run. So I haven't really gone to that. Um, maybe I will, but uh, shoes are, are changing the way we stand, the way we walk, the way we run. And they're affecting the skeletal structure of the feet, remolding and remodeling the feet and the toes and the arches. And they're affecting the skin of the feet, uh, making them more vulnerable to infections because the skin is usually kept a little bit more moist inside of a shoe and in the dark rather than being in sunshine with UV radiation and, and air and those sorts of things. And so shoes can just have a dramatic effect on the feet in many different ways. Now when it comes to standing in heels, heels definitely affect the way we stand because and the way we walk because uh, our body weight is being unnaturally shifted in our foot. If our body was a stiff rod, which it's not, because we have joints you know, from our spine, our hip, our hip, knees, our ankle, all the way down our body, we have joints. Uh, and so when we, put a, when we elevate our heel, if we want to stand with an elevated heel, we can make postural adjustments all the way up the body to accommodate that. If our bodies were stiff like a rod, it would not take much to tip the body over. In fact, the body kind of wants to fall over anyway, remember? the Most of our body weight is in front of our spine in the trunk and the upper body weight. And so we want to fall over and it takes a little bit of muscle activity to constantly pull on us uh, from the backside to keep us from falling over. If you put any kind of weight, or excuse me, any kind of height under your heel at all, it would just tip us right over and we'd fall over. But we don't because of those postural adjustments. So here we have, when you're standing barefoot, a weight hanging from the knee, and we see that it comes right behind the medial malleolus. The body weight is distributed about 50% to the heel and 50% to the forefoot. When you put a one-inch heel um, under your foot, or I'm not sure if that's one inch or one and a half inch, uh, the body weight is shifted uh, forward. As you see, the weight is moving in front of the uh, malleolus, and you've got about, if you put your, if you're standing on a pressure plate, you'll find that about 60% of your body weight is on the forefoot and 40% on the heel. And with a three inch heel, 90% of your body weight is on the ball of your foot and only 10% of your body weight is on the heel. And obviously the weight is swinging way over uh, the foot. So uh, when you elevate your heel, you're putting more body weight on the ball of your foot and you're also putting more body weight onto your knee joint, which is causing the um, arthritis that's so common with women. And actually, when we look at, you know, one, one question I have is why are high heels so popular? I personally do not like high heels, okay? I just, I would prefer to see you barefoot than in high, than in high heels. But high heels are absolutely considered attractive, uh, dare I say sexy, in the world in which we live. And why is that? The reason is because when you put your... Uh, when you stand on a three inch heel, uh, just we kind of use a three inch as a standard. When you stand on a three inch heel, in order to keep from tipping over, you have to make these postural adjustments, which include more tension on your calf muscle. And that more tension on the calf muscle creates muscle tone, which makes your legs look prettier. You have muscle tone on your thigh, as there's more tension on the muscles in your thigh. Your pelvis is tilted about 15 degrees uh, when you're with three inch heels, your pelvis will be tilted forward about 15 degrees. That makes your butt stick out a little bit more. That's sexy. You um, have to have a greater curvature in your back uh, in order to get yourself upright again as your, pelvis is uh, as your pelvis is tilted over. And so that looks attractive. And of course the breasts are being forced to stick out a little bit more. That looks attractive. So there's a whole bunch of things going all the way to up the body, up and down the body uh, to make these adjustments from standing on a three inch heel, which most people interpret as being adding, you know, attractiveness. Like I said, I would rather see 
I'd rather see you barefoot than in three inch heels. In addition to changing the anatomy of the toes by scrunching your toes together, the narrow toe box also changes the efficiency of the great toe during push off in the gait cycle. So as you're walking and you're ready to step off and push into your next step, normally the, your body weight is moved medially to the uh, ball of your foot and then onto your great toe and you push off on your great toe. And so when you graph, uh, you know, for across the width of the foot where the most of the pressure is coming off, it's coming off on the very medial side of your foot at the big toe. However, in shoes, the pressure is coming off in the middle of the foot on the second and third toes. And um, that happens inside footwear, but even worse, over the years, <clears throat> that pattern continues even when you walk barefoot. So on the, the, the graph and the footprint on the left is showing what happens in healthy feet when you walk barefoot. On the right, we're seeing what happens where the pressure is uh, under your foot as you push off when you're wearing shoes and also later in life as you walk barefoot it continues to come off in the middle of your foot and that may be in, largely because the big toe remember the great toe can move uh, laterally over toward the other toes in a condition called halix valgus here is a picture uh, showing let's see in the top the photograph of those feet in the top is from a filipino man 30 years old who has never in his life ever worn a shoe. So that's what feet look like on a 30 year old man who's never ever worn a shoe. Those are healthy feet. They look kind of strange to many Westerners because they the forefoot is so wide, but that's the way your foot should look. It should be fairly triangular with the heel being narrow and then branching out uh, and getting wider as you move toward the toes. The two big toes, the two great toes you can see in this person, uh, basically can essentially touch each other uh, when he's got his feet together. Compare that to the uh, feet below, <clears throat> which look an awful lot like the boots that those feet came from. So those are uh, from a person who's been wearing those sorts of boots all of his life. And uh, he's got a, you know, a V shape uh, to his, the two big toes are going off in a V shape. Uh, wouldn't be able to touch his two big toes together at all. Of course, the arches look like they're demolished. The skin looks pretty bad. Uh, these shoe, these feet are pretty banged up from shoes. If this photograph looks old to you, it is. It was published in 1905. This is over a century old. It was published in a journal in 1905 where a uh, scientist was looking at the effect of shoes on feet. And so we've known for a long time, for well over a century that shoes affect the anatomy of the feet as well as the biomechanics of standing and walking. So this is not new information that I'm sharing with you. All right, so I already talked, you know, a little bit about the anatomy of a shoe. And uh, just to recap some of that, we have a shoe has an elevated heel on it. Usually uh, most shoes have at least an inch and often an inch and a half uh, or, you know, at least an inch to an inch and a half. The uh, the typical trainer or tennis shoe, as we sometimes call it, has a, a curve up on the toes, which is called the toe spring. This is because the shoe sole, the outer sole, is hard. It's hard to make it more durable, so it will last longer. But when it's really hard, that makes it very difficult to walk. So the sole is curved upward at the front to create the toe spring so that you roll into your next step and it makes walking a lot easier in these devices called shoes. We have instep support and outer, and you know, outer step support, uh, arch support on the inside, <clears throat> laces. There's a number of structures here uh, for, the, for the shoe. The most important parts uh, for our conversation will be the, the uh, heel, the elevated heel, the elevated toe spring, the toe box itself, which is narrow all the way around it, and uh, the arch support, which of course is on the inside of the shoe. Now the uh, one problem that people have with uh, that, you know, they go to a shoe salesman or a, a foot doctor may tell them that they over pronate. Now pronation is when your foot is tilting inward, basically your arch is collapsing and your foot is collapsing inward. That's uh, called pronation. Over pronation is when you do that too much. And 
what could possibly be causing overpronation? Well, it turns out the shoes, again, are a major cause. The, all of these features in the shoes, the toe spring, the elevated heel, the crunched toes, all of those things conspire to destabilize the foot and cause it to uh, pronate or fall over. This is demonstrated quite nicely in this video right here. I would encourage you to watch that video. Uh, I'm not sure where the link for that is. I will get it for you. It's not... There it is. Okay, there's the link. I thought it was on here somewhere. So if you if you go to that link on uh, YouTube, it will show you that video, and he unpacks. Again, this is Ray McClanahan, podiatrist in Portland. He unpacks how the toe spring, the elevated heel, the narrow toe box, all of these things conspire to destabilize the foot and cause it to tilt over. Now, in order to stop that, you can crank, you can uh, jack it up with an arch support, and that's typically what's done is an orthotic or an arch support is uh, added to the, in, the medial side of the foot to support the arch and to keep it from pronating in this way. But that's really a Band-Aid, which is actually going to cause more problems in the long run. Not a good idea. Just comparing the stance uh, with the shoe on versus barefoot, you can see how the toes, because of the toe spring, uh, there's a angle there. <clears throat> and uh, the toes are in a constant hyperextension. The heel is lifted, and so the lowest part of your foot in a shoe is the ball of your foot. Standing barefoot, uh, you're, there's about a 90 degree angle, or there is a 90 degree angle, from your leg uh, at your heel. So what's marked here is D. Basically it's showing a 90, a 90 degree angle. Your toes are flat on the ground, where they can both feel the ground and grip the ground, which is important for biofeedback and important for uh, walking, especially for pushing off and, and maintaining your balance those sorts of things. So standing barefoot is very different than standing in trainers. Your toes are not hyperextended. Your arch, see in the trainers, because your toes are hyperextended, your your heel is up, the ball of the foot is lowest, and there's an arch support. The whole thing is a cast, which is keeping your windlass mechanism engaged. Here, when you're standing barefoot, uh, it's not engaged, but it can be, and it will be, when you take a step. So that's, that's dependent on the movement of the toes. Remember the big toe, the range of motion, can be 40 degrees flexion and 90 degrees extension. So there's a, a pretty big range of motion in your big toe, and that range of motion is important in the windlass mechanism while you're walking. So here, again, with footwear, you can't, the hard sole makes it very difficult to walk on that, and that's why we have the toe, the, uh, toe spring, so that your foot rolls on the... Uh, front of the shoe and into your next step. That's going to be quite different than the uh, movements of the big toe as it goes from ex uh, you know flexion and extension and engaging the windlass mechanism. The arch support, uh, it stabilizes the arch in a way that's detrimental. The arch is supposed to be dynamic, not static. The uh, Above uh, the foot here is a drawing of a shock absorber, kind of, that you might find on a car. And it's just by way of analogy, a shock absorber is placed on a car to absorb the shock so that driving down the road, uh, you don't feel every little bump in the road. It smooths it out so it's more comfortable. And, of course, it's better on your car and on your body. But imagine if a mechanic said, you know what, you've got this uh, thing in your uh, under your car that is got this rod that's going up and down and it's compressing and we can stop that by putting a brace on it and that'll keep that from collapsing and it will support this uh, shock absorber well, that's fine it'll keep the rod from collapsing but then it completely obliterates the function of the shock absorber which makes the ride much more uh, much less comfortable and more damaging on your car doing that on your foot has essentially the same effects uh, the arch is supposed to collapse and rise and collapse and rise uh, with your steps. If you don't allow it to do that, it's going to have a negative consequences. It's going to have negative consequences on your foot uh, during the gait cycle. And finally, with running, not going to go too much into running, uh, but shoes do dramatically change the way we run as well. Here is a picture, basically a, a cartoon of a person who is the way they run barefoot versus with shoes on. And the main difference is the extension of the knee and the heel strike. So when you run with shoes on, 
you tend to have your knee all the way out in ex full extension and landing on your heel. Uh, that's called heel strike, and it's extremely uh, it, impactful. The impact forces are quite high when you do this, and the shock absorb the shock is going up your leg because your knee is uh, fully extended, and the shock is increased all the way up to your brain. So this has been measured in a couple of different studies where they're measuring, measuring the impact forces and they measure them on your knee, on your hip, and they can measure these forces all the way up to the brain and the impact forces are in increased by this heel strike with a knee extension. When you take your shoes off and run barefoot, you won't run like that because quite frankly, it hurts. You can't land on your heel with your knee extended because it will hurt. This is a great example of pain being used to modify uh, your actions, and in this case, the way you run. So you will modify the way you run, and you will do more of a forefoot strike, or perhaps more of a flat foot, but you will not do a heel strike, and you will keep your knee flexed, and that uh, helps your knee to also be a shock absorber for the rest of your body. Your foot behaves more as a shock absorber, your knee behaves more of a shock absorber, and these are decreasing the shock that's felt on your joints and your bones all the way up your body, all the way to your brain. I don't know why it is, but everyone runs with their leg out, landing on their heel when you put on shoes. Here are two professional runners. And you see the professional runner um, on the right do it with his running shoes on, and he's got his knee pretty extended. He's landing on his heel. He's doing a heel strike versus the guy on the left. Now, he's got his knee pretty extended, but he's doing a, f a four-foot strike, and so his body weight is still, uh, his leg is not out as far uh, as the the gentleman wearing the shoes. Now, this guy is wearing a type of shoe, a sandal. It's called a minimalist shoe. It's basically just a thin piece of rubber strapped to his foot, but it doesn't have all the cushioning <clears throat> and the support structures that we find in modern running shoes. I mean, our modern running shoes even have springs and microchips and all sorts of stupid stuff. Here's a picture of me. That was many years ago. And uh, Dr. Mitchell and Dr. Dinsmore and we were running. Now, I'm the position of my feet are pretty useless, but comparing Dr. Mitchell to Dr. Densmore is useful because uh, he is landing on his heel with his knee locked, and she is landing flat foot with her knee bent. Perfect example of the difference between running barefoot and running with shoes. <laughs> Obviously, I didn't stage this. I wasn't telling Dr. Densmore how to run, and I wasn't telling Dr. Mitchell how to run. Uh, she's a barefoot runner and has been for many years, and that's the way she runs. And he's a runner who wears shoes and has been for many years, and that's the way he runs. Now, when I showed him this picture, he did decide to uh, try to... He, he, he did not decide to take his shoes off, but he did decide to uh, try to adjust his gait to be a little bit more friendly to his joints. But it's hard to do that. Once um, You can consciously change your gait, but then you'll subconsciously go back to it probably. Uh, if you continue to wear shoes, you'll go back to that bad gait. All right, so here is one of the more famous studies on barefoot running versus shod running that made the cover of Nature magazine uh, a few years ago, probably close to 10 years ago now. Uh, I, I made a, I think I mentioned to you guys in class that <clears throat> pedometers don't tend to work very well when you're walking barefoot because you don't feel the impact forces. The pedometer doesn't feel the impact forces walking barefoot that you feel when you're wearing shoes. So the... Um, there is a difference there. Here's here that. Jump off a table landing with your knee locked and landing on your heel. If you try to jump off a table with your knee locked landing on your heel, you're probably going to end up in the emergency room. And yet that's kind of what you're doing when you're running with shoes and you're landing on a heel with a heel strike and your knee locked. All right, so that's going to wrap it up for the foot and the ankle. I hope you learned some new stuff and enjoyed it. Um.